All right. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Um, so we are getting to the last lesson study of the quarterly, and uh, we are in lesson 13, and it's uh, titled Rebirth of Planet Earth. So I'm going to start with the memory text as usual. And the memory text is found in Isaiah 65, verse 17. And it reads, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. So uh, we'll talk about that verse in just a moment here, but before I go any further, I'm just going to just overview the Sabbath afternoon uh, commentary or whatever we, it is that we call it. Um, so it talks about a 12-year-old boy reading a book on, a, on, an astro on astronomy, uh, and then he refused to go to school after he read the book because the book, he said, on astronomy, said that one day the sun is going to burn out and all life on Earth will vanish. So the mother uh, was hysterical, of course, and uh, because he wasn't going to school and he had this idea that one day the Earth was just going to vanish. So she took him to the doctor and the doctor said that uh, he, he told uh, his name was Billy. You don't need to worry because by the time this happens, we'll all be long dead anyway. Of course, that's part of the problem. In the end, we're all dead anyway. <laughs> so it doesn't sound very promising. I mean, especially for, for a young child, right? To just, uh, well, why, why all this? Why, if, if, if it's all going to be in vain and one day God's just going to, or in this case, it wouldn't be God because if he had known about God, he would know that yeah, one day it's going to all disappear, but there's a hope that we have as Christians that it's all going to be made renew again one day, but not like the former, of course. Okay, so let's just go right into Mondays. We've got a lot to cover. Um, I'm going to read a lot of scripture. I'm going to try and give you guys a chance to read uh, some scriptures also. But uh, Sunday's lesson is titled, New Heavens and, New, and a New Earth. Do we have any comments so far on, on the opening? Okay. So, uh, New Heavens and New Earth. So, Isaiah 65. Uh, our focus today is mainly at the end, which is 65 and 66, the last chapters of Isaiah. Um, so, 65, verse 17 through 25 is pretty much the focal point because it's also where we find the scripture reading, where we find what I just read. So I'm going to just read through it briefly, and then we're going to go over it. Um, so 17, 65, 17. For behold, and I just read that, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people as a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. Okay, so I'm going to go back because rather than just read through it, because the lesson covers different parts of this, so I'm going to change up for a moment. So we're going to just talk about from the beginning. So from the beginning it says, uh, New heavens and a new earth. So, of course, notice that heaven is plural there, right? So, what are the heavens that are being talked about here? Um, I know we're all pretty familiar with this. I mean, there might be somebody here today that isn't. But So, if it's heavens, plural, what are, what, what are we talking about? Uh, isn't there just one heaven? There's different heavens. There's different heavens. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. It could be the heavens. Yes. Uh, it could be other, uh, other solar systems and so forth, and other planets, and so we believe there were other people there. So there's going to be a new creation that's even going to look back, believe it or not, the universe itself. Uh, Absolutely. And its attitude uh, toward us and, and sin, of course, that happened at the cross. Uh, but the nice thing is that it is new. And because it's new, Jerusalem is now called the New Jerusalem. A new name. It's not like Canaan. Canaan, you die. You know, you, you know, you, that was supposed to be nice too, but uh, this is going to be much better, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, 
Okay, so we have three heavens, according to the Bible. Uh, the first heaven would be where Genesis talks about in the creation period. The first heaven is the Earth's atmosphere, which, by the way, how many layers of atmosphere do we have? Anybody know? I didn't, there's more than that, actually. But um, so the point is, is the first heaven is the Earth's atmosphere. The second heaven would be into the, the, uh, the uh, past our atmosphere into the second heaven, which is, uh, you know, the stars and the heavens. And once we get into outer space, I'll just say. So outer space would be the second heaven. The third heaven is where God resides. So we can see the first and the second, but we can't see the third heaven. But the Bible tells us the third heaven is where God resides. So that's why he says new heavens and new earth. Not speaking about heaven, the third heaven, but the new heavens concerning the earth's atmosphere. And there will be change also in the universe, apparently. But, okay, so new heavens and a new earth. And it says, uh, the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Does that mean everything that God's going to wipe our memories completely clean of all of our memories that we had on earth? No? Um, I believe what it's telling us is that the former things and the things spoken of here, because think about it, we're going to remember throughout eternity a uh, plan of redemption. Uh, Christ's wounds, the Bible says, will be there throughout eternity. So, of course, we know that we're going to have memory of things. But the things that the Bible's talking about is most likely the, the things that weren't pleasant, the things that bothered us, the bring, things that brought us uh, pain and suffering in our lives. Those things won't be remembered anymore. Okay, so those things are going to be gone also. Uh, you know, uh, no more weeping, uh, no more sickness, uh, no more dying. So the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing. Um, so when he says, uh, uh, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy, uh, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and my holy people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her. So keep in mind here that when we read prophecy at times, or excuse me, when we read things like what we're reading here, uh, there's dual applications. And in this case, we have to go back and forth to the old Jerusalem. And in this case, that's what God is talking about. Because when he says uh, rejoicing and uh, the voice of weeping shall, be no, long, shall uh, no longer be heard in her, Remember, Jerusalem, the original Jerusalem, had a lot of disappointments throughout their history. You know, they had a lot of oppression, constantly oppressed, right, by other nations. Um, the things that happened to them when we read, especially now where we're reading in Isaiah and, uh, of course, the Babylonian captivity, we know that there was a lot of things that were, you know, heartbreaking and heart-wrenching and just things that, that just... Uh, you know, we would like to forget about. So that's why he's saying there will be no, uh, there'll just be rejoicing, and he's speaking of the new Jerusalem as opposed to the old Jerusalem. All those things will be uh, done away with. Uh, nor the voice of crying. Uh, 20 reads, No more shall an infant from there but live a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. Now those scriptures right there are a little bit difficult to understand, and they, they kind of sound... Well, wait a minute. It says an infant lived but a few days. So I'm going to give you guys an opportunity. No, I think that puts it very nicely. Okay, how does it put it? It actually restructures it so it's mm -hmm. almost done. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days. Yes, well, that's what it says here. Is that a that yeah, saying? I probably didn't read it correctly. Yeah, it says never again. Yeah. So, so what is it saying? It's you know, never again shall an infant live but a few days. Uh, you know, we know that back in, in times of antiquity, and even now, that, uh, you know, we have sudden infant death syndrome, right? Yeah. Infants die uh, in days. Uh, but back in, in, in times of antiquity, uh, it was, life was very, very hard. 
And so that would take its toll on, on the mothers. And so the infants, a lot of times, would be stillborn. And so this is what the Lord is saying. He says, uh, you know, no longer will an infant live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. Uh, we know that a lot of times life is cut short for man, right? But God is saying that no longer will this be um, in the new earth and the new heaven, or, or excuse me, the new heavens and the new earth. Um, so let me go on and read a little bit further. I don't want to cover it all. I just want to stick to the lesson study because sometimes I get ahead of myself. Okay, so the question asks is what kind of restoration does the Lord promise here? And we see in the last study it says uh, those things won't be remembered anymore, no weeping. Uh, so let's move on to the next one. It says, uh, nice as it is, why is this not a picture of our final restoration, our final hope? <clears throat> Any takers on that one? Okay, it's a little bit difficult, I found, in this, in this early part of this study to try and get through it all and explain every bit of it. So I don't want to explain every bit, but I do want to cover the scripture and for us to get a better understanding, that's why we're here, here today. But let me read what the lesson study says, I'll just, and, and then we'll see if we can decipher from there. It says, thus far we have a picture of twang, uh, excuse me, tranquil long lives in the promised land. But even though the people live longer, they still die. Where is the radical transformation of nature? We expect the creation of new heavens and new earth. The next verse tells us the wolf and the lamb. Okay, so I didn't really catch that. Did anybody here catch that? So I'm going to be honest. You know, I, didn't, it, I looked at it and looked at it, and uh, I didn't really understand what it was saying. You know, uh, it says thus far. We have a picture of tranquil, long lives in the promised land, but even though people live longer, they still die. Uh, yeah, go ahead, sister. I don't have a line for this, but I think they mean that's how in our study. Mm -hmm. We haven't got the answer to the fact that verse 58 is about the baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, but as far as the part about the baby at 100, what that's trying to say is that eternity, it's trying to explain to us eternity, that even at 100 years, we haven't even yet begun. Okay. So as an as a infant, we're still an infant at 100 years in the promised land. So, okay, so just keep that in mind for a minute. And yeah, like you said, we'll probably figure it out as we go along here. Okay, so, and then it goes on to tell us in the next verse, let me just read that. Uh, and, and as you said, for, uh, so 20 says, No more shall an infant from there live a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. So it's saying there that even after 100 years, the sinner is still cursed. Because remember, that is eternal. As far as the sinner goes and sin and the death, that's forever. So it's saying that, uh, that uh, even after 100 years, the, the sinner will still be accursed, right? Okay, so then it goes on to say, uh, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Okay, um, so what it's saying there is, Back to old uh, Jerusalem is where it's going. Because remember, back in the time before the Babylonian captivity, uh, people had vineyards and crops and, and stuff that other people would come in after and reap the benefits. Okay? So that's what, it, that's what it's saying there. Go ahead. We, we have that today. Yes. It's just not here. Yes. Uh, Interesting. You, you will inherit a house from a family member. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, thank you, brother. Uh, so, uh, and also when you think about it, when you think about uh, how many people are familiar with the sabbatical year in the Bible? Any hands? Or the Jubilee. Okay, so the sabbatical year was, and I love this, because it's a representation of the, the millennium, the thousand years is this, you know, after seven thousand, when we get to the seven thousand year, well, it was the seventh year that the Israelites were told not to harvest their crops. And the reason was, was because God wanted to let the land rest, okay? So during that time, they would allow uh, people that, that were poor and that didn't have anything to come in and glean from the crops freely. They could eat as much as they want. They weren't allowed to take it out with them, but they were allowed to take and eat from those crops. So there you go also, the, the people that planted the crops didn't eat those crops in the seventh year. So, um, says, uh, 22 says uh, that they shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant another eat. For the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. Uh, when you think of trees sometimes, you know, there's trees that uh, have been around. I mean, when you read in the Bible, there's trees that they would use that would be there for other generations that would come and see that tree. So what it's saying is the life of a tree at times can be pretty long. Yes, brother, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, so we know trees can live a pretty long time. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, God often uses trees, right, in reference. Um, but this is what he's saying with the tree. Uh, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble, for they shall be, <clears throat> excuse me, the descendants of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. So these are the promises of the Lord. Um, uh, 25, I'm going to go to 25 because it's the next question here, and it says, uh, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like, an, uh, like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Okay, so uh, do we see reference anywhere else of the lion and the lamb feeding together or lying together? Yeah. Absolutely, we see that in Revelation, but we also see it repeated here because it also said it before in Isaiah uh, 66, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, the, the, I'm going to go back to the lesson study and what it says here. So it says, uh, the next verse tells us, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. Um, so, That's right, that's right. So we have a reference to uh, Genesis there. But, you know, interestingly enough, when it says the lion shall eat straw like the ox, what did, what did animals eat before the fall? Did they eat other animals? No. No, they were vegetarian, weren't they? All of the animals. Uh, and because the reason is there was no death, right? So it's, what God is showing us is a picture of restoration there. From the beginning, he's saying, I'm going to go back and do it all over again and make it the way it should have been originally. Okay, um, so it says, uh, on my holy mountain, says the Lord, Isaiah 65, 25. What is this reference to the holy mountain? What does that mean? Why does God use the mountain as a reference? Think about Daniel. Okay, when we, when we do studies on the book of Daniel, when it talks about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember the statue? What happens to that statue at the end? It's destroyed. By what? A rock carved out without human hands. 
That's right. That's right. And so the rock comes, and it hits the feet of the statue, and it, and it pulverizes it, and those pieces end up turning into a mountain that covers the earth. Right? Is that right? A mountain. So here you have the reference of the mountain. The mountain, when God says that, represents his holy kingdom. So whenever you read mountain in the Bible, that's what God is referring to. He's referring to his kingdom. So this mountain covers everything. God is saying, this, this is going to be my kingdom here on earth. Right? Okay. So... <clears throat> uh, I'm going to just read further. It says, For carnivores such as lions to become vegetarian requires far more than a vegetarian cooking class. It requires a recreation to restore the world to its ideal state as it was before sin uh, in Eden introduced death. Um, I'm just going to go to the bottom here for the sake of time. Uh, all the Lord's holy mountain would begin with Mount Zion at Jerusalem, it was only a precursor, a symbol of what God promised to do ultimately in the new world with his redeemed people. So there you have it. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read the bottom. Uh, I'm going to. I'm just going to read it just briefly. Suppose instead of living 60, 70, 90, or even 100 years, most people lived a million years or more. Why still would the fundamental, or the fundamental problem of humanity not be solved? Why is eternal life the only answer to our deepest human needs? And those are just rhetorical questions I'm just going to throw out there to think about, okay? Uh, unless somebody wants to comment. Go right ahead. Yeah, amen. Yeah, well put. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, brother. I'm just going to take a step back. I've caught up on the, the last verses in, 20, in uh, verse 25. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm reading this, and this, this, these are just my thoughts. You know, I have nothing to back this up other than that's the context type of thing. But sure, of course. If you have the wolf and the lamb, the lion, they're, they're all eating straw like an ox. Okay, those, those animals were obviously affected by the fall of man. Right. Dust. So this, this serpent is cursed not only by crawling around on its belly, but it is literally eating and taking in and digesting. And what we eat is what we are. So this serpent is like like living death almost, you know, mm -hmm. spirit within it. It says that dust shall be the serpent's food. That's one line of time. In my mind that in, in my mind that I, I could interpret that as the serpent will be no more. Um, it it ate what it is and it's gone. It's gone. Yeah, I agree. Because you just brought something to mind for me. Uh, what, and we're going to see this hopefully if we get to that. Uh, what happens uh, at the very end when uh, wickedness and evil is destroyed and, and the wicked are destroyed, they're turned to dust, to ashes, right? Uh, let me make one more comment real quick too, though, because you, you, you were talking about this still. Uh, notice it says the lion and the lamb. Who's the lion and the lamb? Jesus, both of them. That's right. But I'm going to give you one kind of interesting that came to me earlier in the week also, though. Uh, God often uses... Remember, Satan is a counterpart. He has a counterpart to everything God has, right? Is Satan known as the lion in the Bible? Yeah. A lion that lets those uh, seek to be yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The lion in the Bible represents uh, a warrior or someone going into battle. Yes. Yes. But here's one. Um, uh, this one really got me. Uh, is Jesus referenced as a serpent also? Yeah. Yes, because he took sin upon him. Yes. Yeah. And uh, when Moses lifted 
Yeah. There you go. That's right. That's right. So it's kind of interesting, you know, the the, uh, the way God uses symbolism, but sometimes it, it can go both ways. And so, like, yeah, the lion and the lamb, the reference to Jesus. That's right. Well, well, we experienced that. I would give an exception to the, to the serpent thing. Okay. Jesus was not necessarily represented as the serpent. Uh, what happened was, if there was a snake, a uh, shepherd would kill the snake, and then he would lift it up mm-hmm. and show that it was dead. That's right. Jesus dying on the cross killed the serpent. Yeah. So that still could represent that the serpent is Satan. Absolutely. It's just that Jesus being lifted up was the death knoll defeating the serpent Satan. Yeah. Um, Satan is definitely the what, what is described in the prophecy of the serpent in Genesis 3 yeah. right mm-hmm. so the serpent still eating dust as Mark was saying that that represents death that the serpent is going to die the devil is going to die at the end mm-hmm. yeah yeah Right. Um, we have this last week there was another shooting in Colorado. And not to get into, you know, the whole, you know, everybody has their own ideas on how to fix that. Um, taking away things, creating laws, is not going to fix it. That's right. Um, I, I don't know if you remember when it, uh, Cain picked up an AR-15 and killed Abel. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, think about it. Would we want this world to continue at the rate it's going now? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So God has to do away with it all and redo it. But, yeah, thank you for your comments. I appreciate those. We're getting some really good stuff out of this. Uh, Anybody else have any comments so far? Okay, let me just move on then. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go to Monday's lesson. And Monday's lesson is entitled Divine Magnet, and we're looking at Isaiah 66, verse 1 through 19. Uh, And the question reads, keeping in mind, and we're going to look at the scripture, but let me just bring the question up. Uh, The time in which Isaiah wrote, what is the basic message he is given here? Okay, so let's take a look at it just briefly. Uh, Give me one second. Mm, 66, one, okay. Uh, and it's interesting because I like that I have headings on this, and it says uh, true worship and false worship, so it gives us a clue right from the start. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth, and earth is my footstool. So we understand the, the heaven being his throne, but what about the footstool part? What is God saying about the, what does he mean when he says the footstool? Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, sure. Any other comments? Any takers? Mm 
You're jumping ahead. You're jumping ahead just so we know, though, right? I said you're jumping ahead just so we know, right? Yeah. No, no, I, because the question was the footstool part. But go ahead, brother. Just, just keep talking. I'm just, just didn't want to confuse. sinning in their hearts, but they were giving external compliance to God. And I want to read you a statement, if you don't mind. No, go right ahead. Nice. Okay. And he talks about this, and um, he says this. Let's put this another way. It is possible to get the victory over diet and bad habits, but it's quite another thing to love all of one's enemies all the time and pray on a regular basis for those who desperately need them. One of the true paradoxes of the Pharisees of all ages is that by uplifting behavior and rule, they've actually lowered the requirements of God. Uh, he goes on to say, thus the church has down through the ages faced Sabbath keepers and even vegetarians who are meaner than the devil. <laughs> Such church members have their laws and rules and regulations, but they have neglected the foundational principles of the law. Mm. We must never forget that it was strict law keepers who put Jesus on the cross because he did not hold the Sabbath according to their expectation. Mm -hmm. I think that's the lesson of Isaiah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so forth. And, uh, you know, Jesus told them about tithing. He said, it's okay to tithe, but you've missed the most important part of the message. That's right. Because they didn't love. That's and right. It was motivated from an idea of looking and attracting people. If I tithe and I do this and then people know about it and they see me praying in public and I do all this. Uh, you know, Jesus said, go to pray, pray, pray behind the closed doors, uh, and so forth. And even Paul says in his testimony that before he was converted, that he was doing the work that he was doing to attract and please people, and so forth. So we can do that as Christians. I mean, in the church, we do things because we want to make sure we focus on us. That's right. And so forth. So, you know, this is really, Isaiah 56 is really, really very good with regard to emphasizing what Paul was trying to teach in the New Testament mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And again, it's a hard lesson for us to learn. So that's it, but I thought that was something to yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you, brother. Yeah, and thank you for reading that for us too. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, we do have these same issues today, same issues. And, and some of us might not even realize that we might have that problem, you know, but I think it's so easy to fall into that trap. You know, I was just real quick, uh, I was watching a video early this mo earlier this morning guy interviewing people on the street and why is it and 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 I know but I'm just gonna just say why is it that people believe that the way to heaven is just being good <laughs> they, they honestly truly do and I'm talking people outside of the church and people inside of the church because we do get confused the Bible goes over and over and over and tries to tell us no your works and your goodness does not get you to heaven but people honestly believe that. They say, well, you know, I'm a good person and I know God, God's gonna, you know, I'm gonna go to heaven because God is good. And God is not a condemning God. He's a God of love. You know, and when you take that part of the condemnation part out, you know, the justice part, then you take the love out too. Because truly, uh, if God just let everything go on the way it is and us get away, it's like going into court and letting a murderer go free. There's no justice there. And so God being love has to have the justice side of him. Uh, who had the... Okay, go ahead, brother. Uh, footstool. You, you used the... Yes, what, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the footstool. Uh, footstool, as far as I know, only has one use. That's to rest your feet, right? Yes. You don't use it to reach something higher. You don't use it as a stepping... If, if you're using it as a, as a ladder, it's a stepping stool. Right, right. This is a footstool. Yes. So when we look at Genesis, we, we get to Genesis chapter 2, it says God rested. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Exodus 20, it says God rested. Mm -hmm. When we get to Jesus, Jesus died on the cross and then he rested in the grave over the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. When we get to the end of time, after Jesus has come, he's 
going to live, have a thousand years with him, right? Mm -hmm. And he's going to come back new to new heaven, new earth, and he is going to rest with his people on earth. Mm -hmm. So this is the place that God has chosen to rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you said the place. So the point is that I was going to make the footstool is actually, where's the capital of heaven going to be? Right here on earth. So the capital, the footstool, in other words, and yes, so you're correct. Um, yeah, thank you, brother. Go ahead, bro. I'm going to go against my sister here about the footstool. Thing. Okay. I, I okay. just like this message Okay. John was weeping because no one was able to open the scroll in heaven. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they say, behold, there is one worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then you describe him coming forward to open the scroll as though he, he basically looks just like Joe Lewis. Um, I look and behold, in the midst of the throne and in the midst of the elders, there stood one like a lamb as though it had been slain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, it's, it's I, I still think it's an Indian and Latino and I think they have that foot too. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and like you said, you know, the Bible, that's the beauty of the Bible. Uh, an infant, if you look at it as waters, an infant can wade in the waters. An infant can understand the, the, the basic level of the Bible. But as you said, you know, there is the layers and they go deeper and deeper. And as you get to become a better swimmer, of course, or a better diver, you know, then you're able to to do those, but yeah. Uh, does somebody else have a comment? Okay, so let's just back up just for a second, back to what Brother Chuck, where Brother Chuck was taking us. Uh, verse uh, two, um, I'm not gonna read it all, I'm just gonna start with, uh, it says, on him who is poor and of a, contri a contrite spirit. Uh, well, let's just start with that real quick. Uh, contrite, anybody give me a definition of contrite? It's the feeling, it's like a broken heart, but it's the feeling of remorse and a repentant heart. Okay, that's what a contrite spirit is. And who trembles at his word. Okay, that word trembles. Does God mean like tremble, like fear, tremble? Yes, he does. Um, because you, got, you have to remember, and we see that wording often in the Bible, tremble, right? We know the scripture tells us the same thing, right? Um, and even here, it's, it's saying, trembles at my word. Yes, that's what, is, what God is saying. You know, we should have a, a, a spirit within us that, with that contrite spirit and the trembling, uh, it, it, it's just a reverence and an understanding of who God is that, yeah, it should make us tremble. Uh, and have sorrow for our Yeah, all of that. Spirit is a spirit. Absolutely. Uh, so three says, he who kills a bull as if he slays a man, uh, as, as Brother Chuck already read, and he who sacrifices a lamb as he breaks a dog's neck, he who offers grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. Okay, so in other words, yeah, like you said, Brother Chuck, so there was no uh, contrite spirit or any feeling or anything. It was just going through the motions. Uh, formalism, hypocrisy was what it was. You know, an outside show, you know, uh, uh, just trying to gain the praise of men, right? Is, hey, look at me, you know, I'm very uh, holy and pious. Look at me sac making the sacrifice. But the reason that he says uh, uh, kills a bull is if he slays a man, it, it, there's no difference there. And when he says uh, sacrifices as, as if he breaks a lamb, as if he breaks a dog's neck, which, by the way, a dog is an unclean animal, right? Um... He who offers grain offering as, uh, as he offers, as, as if he's offering swine's blood. So all of these are things that are being done with 
no feeling, no contrite spirit, of course, because the verse right before that said that. Um, so that's what we're looking at here. It's just an outward formalism. Uh, and it says, just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. Okay, so let me stick to the lesson because I don't want to go any further here. Uh, it says, uh, how does God serve as a magnet to draw the nations to himself? So 66 verses 18 and 19. Would somebody like to read that for me? So it's 66, 18, and 19. So God is saying that this would go out to all nations, right? He's showing the nations there when he mentions those. I can't uh, tell you, uh, I should have wrote them down, but I can't say right off the top of my head these, these nations, Tarshish and Pol, Lud, uh, Tubal, or no, uh, Javan. Uh, he says the coastlands are far off, who have not heard my name nor seen my glory. So remember, God says uh, that he wanted to make uh, a, a nation of priests, right? That's what he wants to do, nations, all of us coming together to worship God. This is what God is saying. Um, there's one part here that, uh, and, and uh, it talks about uh, a, a sign. We didn't get to that yet, did we? Uh, where do we see the sign? Uh, we'll catch up to that after. But yeah, he says a sign. And we're not really sure what that sign is, but if you think about the sign that was given after the flood, there was a sign, right? What was that sign? Right. So we probably won't know what that sign is until after we get there. But God says that, uh, it, that he gives it a sign. Uh, let's move forward. Any comments? I'm going to go to Tuesday's lesson before we run out of time. Okay. So Tuesday's lesson is missionaries and worship leaders. Uh, kind of what I led into right now, talking about a nation of priests. Uh, so, what is the meaning of survivors bringing people from the nations as an offering to the Lord? Isaiah 66, 19 and 20. So, we just read that, right? So, the question asked is, uh, what's the meaning of these survivors? And who are these survivors? What is it talking about? So I'm gonna I'm gonna back up for a minute because I probably missed a part. Somebody had a comment? The ones that the ones who yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, give me a second here. I'm gonna back up and go to 17 because uh, it was talking about all these people that do these things that are formalism, of course. Uh, those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination of the mouse. Uh, you know, so if, if people don't think eating swine's flesh, uh, he says, uh, they shall be consumed together, says the Lord. God says he's going to destroy those that eat the flesh of the swine. But then he's, he's also saying, with and the abomination of the mouse. So... I don't think too many people eat a mouse, right? But when you talk to people about the health message and about eating, eating swine, you know, they give a big argument for that. But nobody would ever give an argument for eating a mouse, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, they do in some countries. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see what this part about the survivors. So it said, God sends survivors of his destruction out to the ends of the earth to people who do not know about God. And they shall declare my glory among the nations, 66, 19. This is one of the clearest Old Testament statements on the theme of missionary outward, uh, outreach. In other words, not only are people to be drawn to the Hebrew nation, but also some Hebrew people will go to other nations and teach them about the true God, a paradigm. This is explicit in the New Testament. Um, so is this saying that 
when that time comes when God destroys the world and the wicked, that there's going to be survivors during that time period? No? Then what's it saying? What is it saying then? What is it really telling? What is this time that God is talking about that there's going to be... Dis Look, the very beginning says, God sends survivors of his destruction out to the ends of the earth. What destruction is, are we talking about here? Yes. That's right. New believers and so forth. And so if we take a look at history after the Babylonian... And he's calling those an offering, by the way. He's calling those... It's, it's, yeah, exactly. It's, it's basically a, it's a gift that we're... I should say it was a gift, but it was an offering that was provided to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what, he's, that's what he wants, right? Yes. And so forth. So if you look at history after the Babylonian captivity, and uh, many people going back to Jerusalem, that was the start of that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. Any, anybody disagree with any of that? Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to just move through for the sake of time. There's so much to cover. Um, for example, the lesson tells us uh, about the offerings. And it, it says, offering would be all your kindred from all the nations. Uh, if we looked in Numbers 8:11, there was a time back in the Old Testament uh, it says, for the idea that people could be presented as a kind of offering to God, note the much earlier dedication of the Levites as an elevation offering from the Israelites that they may do the service of the Lord. So at one point, the Levites were offered up as an as a offering to God, right? Okay. Um, what is the significance of God's promise to take some of them as priests and Levites? Isaiah 66, verse 21. Um, and, oh, I know why I couldn't find it. Okay, so Isaiah 66, verse 19 through 21, I'm just going to read it just briefly. It says, I will, set among, I will set a sign among them, and that's the sign I talked about, and those among them who escape, I will send to the nations. And we read that to Tarsus, to Paul, Lud. Um, and it says... Uh, those who have not seen my fame and glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Then shall they bring you, or your brethren, for an offering to the Lord out of all nations. Uh, so we just covered that, but let me just get to the bottom here. It says, uh, so, it says, uh, the term in Isaiah 66 refers to your kindred from all the nations. In the previous verse, these are Gentiles, some whom God would choose as worship leaders, along with the priests and the Levites. Uh, how could people be in the last days, though? Weren't the Levites, didn't they only come from a certain tribe, and they didn't come from all the... So how can we now, or in the future, how can we have people that are not from those tribes be chosen as Levites to serve? And is there going to be a need for... 
Yeah, and it's symbolic too because we're not going to need priests uh, ministering on our behalf anymore, are we? Not at this point, anyway. Go ahead, brother. And, and, and that's the whole thing. It's, it's, it's all it's symbolic. We can't get tied into. Well, it has to be from, uh, direct descendant. Paul said, you know, there's a lot of sons of Abraham that are not from Abraham. Mm -hmm. We get into Revelation, and it talks about the foundation. That's right. And when you look at the names, the names when they when the Jews gave their or Hebrews gave names to their children, that name meant something. And That's when right. you read through the names of Revelation seven, it's a beautiful message of what Jesus does for his church or yeah. his people. Yeah. And only the people are going to get into heaven that fit into that message. Mm -hmm. so it, it's all about symbolism. It's it's sad that some people are getting into this thought now that you have to have 12 tribes, descendants of those 12 tribes that are the 144,000. Right. But we take the whole spiritual side out of it, which forgetting that we are Jews grafted in spiritually. We are Abraham's seed also, right? Yeah, because if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed. That's right. That's right. So there you have it. And thank you for that scripture, brother. Um, okay, so we have, I think, five minutes here. Let's see if we can cover Wednesdays. Or we have a few minutes here. Um, okay, so Wednesday's lesson, community of faith. The Israelites were a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Exodus 19, verse 6 tells us that. With special priests set apart to represent the worship leaders. But in the future, some Gentiles would become worship leaders. Um, okay, would this change affect the renewed community of faith? Um, that's kind of a, a big question there for this end part here. Um, you know what I'm going to do, though, because I don't think we're going to have time to cover this. I'm just going to end it uh, uh, with comments first. Go ahead. I'm, anybody has any, have any comments, feel free to just talk about them right now. That's right. So I think it links this whole thing together. We are bringing other people as a living sacrifice. When the people sacrificed, they couldn't find a lamb with blemish. It needed to be a, a clean and a healthy sacrifice. So for me, this whole thing is about overcoming. If you, we, I think we will be surprised when we get to heaven. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, amen. Yeah, thank you, sister. Uh, any other comments? Okay, let me just end just briefly here. I'm going to just read the summary and end it with that. Isaiah presents a vision of staggering scope. Not only would God purge and restore his community of faith, but he also would enlarge its borders to encompass all nations. Ultimately, the recreation of his community would lead to the recreation of planet Earth, where his presence would be the ultimate comfort of his people. Yeah, God is not only the creator, but he's also the recreator, right? So he's going to do it all over again, yeah. interestingly enough. Okay, I'm just going to have a word of prayer just real brief for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful for these uh, scriptures and uh, the chapters that you've given us at the end of Isaiah, Lord, about uh, what's in store for us, Father, as far as where your people are going to be, Lord, and uh, the things that we will see and the experiences that we will have, uh, we don't even really have truly a true idea that we can grasp of what it would truly be like, Lord, but we know that it's going to be amazing and wonderful uh, as it was in the beginning, Lord. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, today I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, that uh, we would go back and we would look at these scriptures and we would go back and study even harder the book of Isaiah, Lord, to really truly get as much as we can. It's so important, Father, that we understand what our destiny is, Lord. Uh, I just ask for blessings for each and every one of us today as we depart from here today. But as we go into the services, Lord, I ask for special blessings for our leaders and our elders, Father, um, that uh, Christ will be the focus and the focal point of our, uh, of our being here today, Father. Uh, thank you, Lord, and bless us, Father. And uh, I just... Ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.